Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the webinar. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, this is a Dow Jones webinar uh, where we'll be discussing the best practices in um, adverse media screening. Um, as we wait for a couple more to join us today, just a quick uh, few, you know, last housekeeping points before we dive in. Uh, you will see a questions box uh, on the bottom of your screen. Uh, so please feel free to ask any questions um, that you have for any of the speakers uh, that we have today. And we'll leave some time to, to address them towards the end of this uh, webinar. We we'll also have a couple of polling questions. Uh, so instructions will follow. Uh, there'll be two polling questions that we will ask um, to the audience. And uh, it, it would be great that you guys could share your input as well. Uh, in the webinar console, we also have some resources available for you. So just click through to that tab and you might find some things that could be interesting to you to support today's discussion. And um, lastly, I think that this webinar will be recorded. So this will be shared via an email after today's session. So please feel free to share them with your colleagues and teams um, after this uh, webinar. Okay, so I think um, we have a good number of attendees um, joining us uh, right at the hour mark. So I think uh, without further ado, I will kickstart this um, webinar on uh, adverse media screening. So many of you customers are, are actually our customers of Dow Jones. But for those who do not know um, us, we are actually a global provider of regulatory compliance solution covering uh, anti-money laundering, anti-bribery and corruption, sanctions, trade compliance, and whole other suite of risk and compliance solutions. My name is Cliff Lim. Uh, I'm your host for today's session. I am the risk and compliance specialist for the Southeast Asia region uh, for Dow Jones. So I spend a lot of my time uh, working with customers on a daily basis uh, as they build out their financial crime compliance program. So from um, screening of onboarding to transaction monitoring, uh, down to you know the, the newest data and technology tools that they use uh, in financial crime compliance. So, and increasingly these conversations have been uh, around um, adverse media screening recently, uh, from structured data going into the unstructured data world. Um, so I think the reasons why we are all gathered here today is because regulators are increasingly expecting um, you know, banks or financial institutions to conduct adverse media screening uh, to be a part of the bank's anti-financial uh, crime program. So as, as many of you well know, uh, guidance on this specific regulatory requirements uh, is a lot less structured uh, because it revolves around news, it revolves around media screening. Uh, so it's a lot less structured in other areas of compliance and many organizations have formulated their own uh, risk-based models. So in short, a lot of the financial institutions we talk to they might be a bit unclear um, on how to do this efficiently, uh, effectively, and in line with the regulator's expectations. So I think the whole point of us today is to gather a group of um, highly experienced individuals uh, to shed some valuable light on how this can be achieved. Um, so, so without further ado, I will just kickstart this and uh, introduce our speakers uh, before we move into today's presentation and panel discussion. So to kick things off um, and set the scene for discussion about best practice, we first hear from Gavin Lockhart Miriams uh, from Thermis. This is a think tank and financial crime com, uh, consultancy that recently worked with us on a survey-based research project to find out what banks are doing currently. Uh, he's going to share some of those results with you today. Then we have Henry Williams, an Artemis consultant, uh, will bring us through a few case study and recent enforcement action and how proper adverse media screening uh, may help avoid this, um, you know, regulators' um, fines and, 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 and uh, enforcement. We also get some insights from Matthew Fleming, a partner at Corda Menta, uh, throughout today's session. Matthew brings 25 years of experience in law enforcement, forensics, and advisories in today's discussion, um, having handled challenging assignments from factual investigation to large-scale uh, multi-jurisdictional fraud and corruption matters. And lastly, we also hear from David Rostrom, uh, Director of Intelligence at Ripja, uh, a global leader in data intelligence software and also a new partner of Dow Jones. So David will be speaking generally about how AI and um, money laundering can be leveraged effectively and most importantly, reliably uh, to achieve best practice in high volume screening solutions. Uh, so we know Ripja has particular authority on this subject because Dow Jones has recently launched a next generation adverse media screening solution uh, utilizing Ripja's natural language processing or what we always call NLP uh, technology. And we are really excited because this brings out uh, the principles and best practice that we'll discuss today. Um, so with this, uh, let's get started and I'll pass this off to Gavin um, for now. Well, thank you so much, Cliff. And um, it's, it's fantastic to be able to share with 
uh, you wore this, this best practice guide alongside Dow, Jones, and, and Ripjar. Um, and as Cliff said, I'm responsible for Themis's research, and I'm one of the authors of the best practice guide for adverse media screening. So let, let's start with some definitions. Um, and although I expect that the 300 or so people on this call are involved in adverse media screening, just for those who are developing their understanding, and so we all have the right point of departure, it's worth covering some definitions briefly, I think. So ad adverse media screening, also known as media monitoring or negative news screening, is the process by which a customer or a prospective customer is compared or screened against negative news information. And as Cliff says, it's an important part of customer due diligence and enhanced due diligence, but critically compared to regulatory requirements on customer screening for sanctions or for politically exposed persons. For example, the guidance for adverse media screening is less structured and, as Cliff said, more open to interpretation. But as we get started, I think it's probably worth hearing from all of you on the call about some of the challenges that you face when conducting adverse media screening. Um, so let's bring up the first poll. And I'll give you 30 seconds to answer the question about what are the biggest challenges that you face when conducting AMS. Um, but as I, as I do so, it's worth just rehearsing some of the work that we've done as part of this program. So back in September 2019, Down Theme has completed an online survey to understand the challenges faced by those responsible for AMS. And we spoke to frontline staff, C-suite leaders and board members uh, from all around the world, including many in, 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 in Asia Pacific region. And then we completed some in-depth interviews with those leaders to understand uh, some of those challenges. And the result is the best practice guide that we'll go through shortly. Um, so let's let's close the poll and see see where we are. And just to the, the, the next slide, please. Okay, so it, quite, a, quite a mixture th through there. So quality of news sources, but screening in different languages and jurisdictions, uh, particularly with different scripts is something that we hear a lot. Volume of alerts, um, a significant proportion of, of you and false positives around about a quarter. And I think that those are broadly echoed in our own work. I think we'll cover the script issue in some more detail. Um, in fact, when we did our global survey, a third of respondents said that it's difficult to tell whether a story is credible or not. And six in 10 said that accurate identity matching is an issue. Um, it seems to be slightly less of a problem with those of you on the call, but when we look globally, half of the people we surveyed said that about 5% of their matches were true positives. Um, and to get to the next slide then, it, it's worth just reinforcing the fact that Th these are really important issues because unless they're addressed, firms are exposed to financial crime risk. But most of the major regulators say that adverse media screening should or could be conducted. So um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore say AMS should be conducted as part of CDD. H the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, adverse media screening should be conducted for suspicious transaction reports and FATF say something similar, and as do FinCEN, as do the FCA. So the regulators, although they're not prescriptive, are clear that AMS should be conducted. And on the next slide, um, we, we're seeing regulators implementing fines that are direct, directly related to AMS failures. Uh, we'll cover some really detailed case studies, but just to take two examples, um, in March of this year, FinCEN assessed a $450,000 penalty against a top risk officer uh, called Michael LaFontaine at US Bank National Association for long-standing AML uh, failures and, and alert caps. Um, and this allowed millions of dollars to be moved even after several high-profile negative news events and government subpoenas. Um, which in fact uh, started an investigation that later led to a conviction for fraud. 
And so this is interesting, both because um, the fine was 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 levied against an individual, and failures in adverse media screening were highlighted. Um, taking an example that originated in the UK in 2019, the FCA notice relating to Standard Charter Bank highlighted failures in the MENA region, uh, where there was a failure to conduct due diligence in response to trigger events, including uh, when negative press warranted it. And the FCA imposed a penalty there of £102 million. So, um, to, the, to, the, to the guide itself, I think uh, on the next slide, the imperative to conduct adverse media screening is clear, as, as we've seen, and as Cliff has said, but as we say in our research, and as the poll that we've just run shows, many of you find this really hard, and that's completely understandable. Um, and the best practice guide gives firms an easy to use and structured approach to adverse media screening. And the ultimate aim, we hope, is to help organizations, help you all identify special interest and reputation exposed persons and entities according to carefully considered categories of risk enhancing protections against financial crime and enabling banks and other institutions to do business effectively. And our recommended framework that you can see on the slide, and we'll, we'll, we'll share the full guide with you, can be summarized in six steps. Um, and we'd encourage all of our clients and all of Dow's clients to consider these for, for their businesses. Um, I'm actually going to ask some of our other speakers to expand on some of these six points. But just to take the first one myself, um, setting a risk appetite appropriately. As a, a CEO of a tier two bank said to us, without the right principles or a clear risk position, the board will simply waste time debating the importance of individual results. And at Themis, we see many firms where CEOs and senior managers spend more time debating individual cases in this area than any other part of due diligence. And as some of you have said already, because AMS rarely returns this binary result, setting these parameters for what constitutes, constitutes acceptable risk is a critical first step. And this is known as establishing a firm's risk appetite, and that's the amount and type of risk that an organization is willing to pursue or to retain. And the variables that might be considered are the type of report, uh, the degree of linkage, and the timeliness of the content. So moving to the second, second point, ensuring that firms screen at the right time. Uh, in our global survey, nine in 10 said that they screen new customers during the onboarding process. But our interviews brought to light that many regulated entities lack this defined screening strategy, leading to variations in identifying who should be searched for and when. And our recommendation that's backed up by the comments from the regulators is that firms should search for adverse media as part of customer onboarding due diligence before accounts opening and then perform ongoing monitoring based on a schedule guided by policies and the specific customer's risk levels. So that's critical, but it's also important to identify trigger events, so activities that warrant a prioritized, unscheduled investigation of new sources as a result of newly discovered account activity, law enforcement inquiries, uh, media scandals, or, or high-risk high counterparty relationships. So turning to Henry, um, I know you've been closely involved in this area, um, in investigations work and running adverse media screening. What, what's your perspective, Henry, on timings? Um, thanks, Gavin. Um, very interesting that 10% of your respondents um, don't do adverse media searches before taking on a customer, um, because clearly that's the time you should be doing this. Adverse media is a great tool um, rather than sort of blunt instrument or sanctions list, adverse media is a great tool for sort of finding the nuance in the potential client and the risks because obviously you can search against various search strings. Um, so you can find the different types of risk a potential client can have. So it's absolutely important that you do your adverse checks before you take someone on. So that's very much what we mean when we say screen at the right time. Um, also, as you mentioned, ongoing checks. Um, this should become standardized. And what you should do with your ongoing checks is to look at your customer's risk profile 
and then work out how often you're going to need to check them against adverse media sources. Is that going to be monthly, annually? Um, because um, new things will crop up about your clients potentially all the time. Um, so looking at various risk parameters, what you could look at, for instance, might be the country of origin of a person. Say, for instance, if, um, if someone's from Russia or Iran, these are places which are periodically sanctioned. Um, there are also high-risk um, corruption destinations. So these should be looked out for. Um, and then the other thing is um, we talk about something called trigger events. And a trigger event is something which, outside of the normal scale of when you're reviewing your customers, is when you'd actually go and review anyone um, because it's been sort of brought up in the news. And so what I'd say in this instance, a trigger event might be something like the Panama Papers, for instance, where a whole load of new information is coming out and sort of previously reputable businesses were suddenly found to be using sophisticated money laundering techniques or tax evasion techniques. Um, and they should be looked at. Equally, you, have, you could have something like the Danske Bank scandal or the Deutsche Bank um, mirror trading scandal. Periodically, you'll find that um, these big investigations will throw out adverse media checks, which won't have been spotted the first time round. Um, so keeping an eye out for trigger events is absolutely key to making sure um, you're on top of any adverse media references to your customer base. Great, Henry, thank you. And I, I, and I think we'll come on to um, how, how that technology can help set those set those alerts too, but uh, that, that's help, really helpful. Um, so the third strand uh, is around building these checks on credible and current news sources. And as, as, as you have said on those of you on the call who conducted the poll, some firms have trouble ascertaining the credibility of an adverse media alert. So there are specific challenges around whether a story is politically motivated or is an allegation rather than a conviction. Uh, but in, in its most simple, firms just need to know whether the information that they're receiving is true. But timeliness is really important as well. Uh, and so in our, in our work, many people who were screening suggested that in some cases, using the wrong systems, after initial identification of an allegation, further updates to a court case, for example, were not flagged to screening teams. Um, and so turning to you, Cliff, I, I know this is an area where firms rely on Factiva, um, and particularly this, a lot of this information is not available through standard Google searches or is unindexed or uncategorized. Can, can you help us um, understand your perspective from DAO and, and using the Factiva tool in particular? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, like what you said earlier, I think, um, you know, news is something really important. Uh, in general, it helps people make informed decisions, right? I think even from selecting a holiday destination to making an important business decision, we often look to news uh, to guide us, uh, to look for, you know, indicators. So I think any false information is generally very harmful for our community, um, especially in the, the financial crime compliance world. If we were to get, you know, um, news sources that are not credible. So I think this erodes trust, um, which is a, a big problem in, in our industry. So, so I think leveraging on credible news sources is extremely important. And, and even with using Google, Google is an excellent tool um, to look for news. Um, but often enough, we don't go past page two or page three um, of a Google search page. Um, and that's where we might miss out um, certain information, uh, certain more credible news sources that you may find in the latter pages. So I think that is the part where um, Factiva actually really comes in uh, because the articles are tagged. Um, we, we go through a stringent kind of a content licensing uh, uh, approach before we onboard them onto the platform to ensure that, you know, this news comes in, uh, it will not be fake news. And especially in the global pandemic uh, that we are in right now, uh, fake news is, is very prevalent. It's very, uh, you know, sent often through WhatsApp chats, on Facebook, you know, people saying this and that. And, and none of this is actually true until, you know, a verified, you know, government agency or a news source actually come out and say, you know what, we are not shutting the economy now, we are not doing this and that. And, and these are actually things that would actually move and shake the world, uh, you know, through stock markets and all that stuff. So similarly, I think to, to our industry, um, it is the same thing. If you, we, we were to rely on reliable uh, news sources, um, that Factiva has collated, you know, over 32,000 different sources, that would really help uh, kind of at one-stop place to, to screen uh, against a credible set of new sources and to, you know, fairly uh, evaluate a customer. Uh, after all, this is actually, you know, onboarding through an onboarding process or through a, 
uh, continuous monitoring uh, process. This is uh, something that I think is uh, very important uh, as we look up uh, in adverse media streaming and actually getting the source is actually the root of everything uh, that we discussed today. Uh, great, Cliff, really clear and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, points well made. Um, so moving moving on to the, the fourth area, and, and that, that's the importance of creating and, and maintaining an audit trail. Um, and, and this is absolutely critical. So no matter what the ultimate outcome, keeping an audit documented audit trail with the supporting materials that show rationale behind these decisions is, is key because getting it wrong is really costly, particularly in worst case scenarios where firms are found to be involved in financial crime. And when regulators and audit, auditors are inspecting customer files, they will obviously want to see the basis on which a decision is made. And that, that, that is a requirement. Uh, uh, Matthew, you've, you've seen um, firms do this well and, and do this uh, badly. You, what, what, what are the sort of right processes that firms should put in place to ensure that they have the right audit trail and the right information? Yeah, um, unfortunately, I, I, I seem to uh, view these instances from a crisis reaction point of view. Um, and all too often, these steps and the audit trails aren't put in place or aren't robustly maintained. Um, and when looking back at them, it's easy um, in retrospect to look how easily those um, gates that were put up to actually protect an organisation um, have been taken advantage of. So what we're seeing is overrides. Uh, we're seeing the um, improper systems put in place. We're seeing backdoor um, you know, areas manipulated. But overwhelmingly, we're seeing people that aren't doing what is in place correctly. So the onboard process in respect to the due diligence of those people who would be considered important in respect to onboarding, they complete um, uh, the thoroughness that you would expect or that uh, would be deserved of that organisational, sometimes only at a transactional level. Um, and oft times it's described because um, Things that had to be done and had to be excited because of the transaction or situation. And because of this, there's a bit of a gamble that takes place in respect to what is uh, considered, in my, in my view, one of the most important steps is, is the due diligence up front. But this is right through on the aspect of a commercial imperative to get somebody on board. Uh, and therefore, uh, we see that these steps aren't taken or they're manipulated, the product authorities are not undertaken. And from the initial um, implementation, there doesn't seem to be a dynamic process which updates this sort of factor. Um, and we see a lot of circumstances where a political, geographical or even cultural situation changes and that system isn't updated or the due diligence isn't um, enhanced. Uh, so from my view and um, an investigator, it is uh, unfortunately it's in my position to find out where the errors or the negligence or in fact the manipulation occurred because, you know, at the chain's leakest, um, weakest link that we find um, where these exposures are actually taken advantage of or right. um, where the right. errors it's really helpful. So you, you you've covered a whole a whole series of things um, about timeliness and about um, trigger events and and, and as, as people move in and out of risk areas. But as you said at the beginning, the key thing is that the the decisions and the rationale behind those decisions are clear are clearly documented without uh, being skipped or these backdoor issues. So that's that that's um, well explained, I think. Um, and it leads us on to the, the, the fifth area, the penultimate area around using the right technology to reduce um, burdens. Um, and uh, screening technology just helps firms address an unsustainable, potentially unsustainable volume of a a AMS matches, um, and also to, just to show patterns that might not be seen elsewhere. So 
sophisticated adverse media tools such as Ripjar can help reduce false positives and assist with a number of other challenges, including the ability to screen customers who, as Matthew was saying, move between these different risk categories regularly. Um, David, we were talking earlier in the week and you, you were saying that um, Ripjar actually processes around 2 million uh, news record, records a day. Uh, can, can you just help us understand how artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing can help un overcome the, vol the, the challenge of volume. Um, how, how, do, how can technology help? Yeah, so when you have as big a volume of data as, as we process from companies like Dow Jones, um, there's, there's only really one game in town when it comes to how do you make sense of that, and, and that's artificial intelligence. Now, that's an umbrella term and that covers different disciplines, for instance, machine learning, where uh, we're essentially teaching uh, computers to read the news like a human. It also covers natural language processing and entity extraction, where the AI is automatically identifying uh, people's names, company names, locations within the body of an unstructured news article. Now, this is something very easy for a human to do, but actually quite difficult for machines to have typically done. And because of that difficulty, you end up with a lot of false positives. By using and harnessing you know, the, the sort of last 10, 15 years of academic and um, technological progress, we can actually use that to hone in on much more accurate assessments of risk relating to client details uh, that appear within within this huge, uh, you know, millions of items of, of news, and and, and to, so to me, ultimately, this is about scale uh, and how we how we marshal ourselves against the problem. Great, great, thank you very much, David. Um, so the the final area is often overlooked, but it's it's really important, and and that is. The, the way to establish a strong anti-financial crime culture. Because as many of the leaders on this call know, um, anti-financial crime controls can easily be undermined by a poor culture of compliance. And in contrast, a strong AML culture helps prevent shortcomings, identify issues before they become a concern and lead to more efficient compliance policies. Um, uh, and, and Matthew, you sort of touched on this, but as you as you investigate cases and work with a series of firms, can you set out how how firms have or can set the right culture? Uh, yeah, uh, you know I'm, I'm an Australian living in Singapore, but um, for the last twenty years here and, um, and around Asia, um, and setting the right culture um, starts with understanding. The culture you're in, uh, and they, in the Asia Pacific region is, is a blend of multicultural um, systems and and places, people. Um, but it's most important to have the understanding of who and what you're dealing with on the ground. Um, we, for example, we, we investigated a large scale um, corruption involving government officials. Um, in, in Indonesia, and this involved a uh, mine with probably 75% expatriates in the engineering and um, the office sort of uh, capacity. But a lot of the mining uh, technicians, the ones driving vehicles, were part of a local village and tribe, and 90% um, of those were women. Um, and they all were uh, of a religious belief. And if the company just invested some time to understand what the cultural sensitivities were around that and, and uh, how they work together with expatriates and in, indeed how their own vision community understood their working capacity. They could have avoided a lot of trouble, um, but instead and they, they went without much due diligence, not even understanding the prevailing um, the religious culture there and, and try to set forth um, their own, you know, exterior or country cultures and, and work standards there. And within three weeks, the mine was shut down. Um, the workers did not turn up to uh, the, to work. Um, and then to uh, uh, circumvent or to try and catch up, 
the mine owners started to arrive and, and, and concessions to the local leaders and, and leaders and so forth, which then set in a trigger of events, um, which then started a whole um, series of uh, interagency and extra-jurisdictional extra investigations, one of which I became involved in. Now that the quick uh, question that I asked one of the judges, oh, sorry, that I spoke to one of the judges um, when he was, you know, examining me, uh, he said, look, did they did they bother to come and, and visit the site and understand what we're dealing with? And I, I had to say I had no evidence of that. And in fact, it was it was opposite of that. There was, you know, obvious that they just came in and tried to instill their own environment and own, own culture. So it's vastly important to understand where you're going, who you're dealing with, and start off on the right foot. Sure, and so I appreciate you drawing on those, those sort of wide, wider examples. And I, I think the key thing from um, the, the AMS work is the way that we've seen the importance of trying to uh, set culture from from the top, set the right um, uh, leadership, and the way that these um, uh, AMS results are given. Uh, credence and credibility when they're based on, on uh, set up in the way that we've described, um, and, and there's again more detail in, in, in the guide itself. So, um, look, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon a great deal. As I, as I just said, we'll send the guide out to to everybody. Um, but just for now, um, I'd like just to hand back to to Cliff to run our second poll. Yeah, thanks, Gavin, again. Um, so yeah, so like Gavin mentioned, so we have the second poll uh, coming up for you. Um, so this will be uh, the second poll. The question will be on which of these steps uh, would you like to understand more, um, which is coming up right about now. Um, so I think there, there are a few, um, there are five um, options that we have here. Um, so I think the first is to set your risk appetite clearly and perform a risk assessment. Um, screening at the right time, uh, so looking at the right opportunity to do it. Uh, build checks based on credible um, current news sources, which is what we covered earlier. Um, create and maintain an audit trail, which is what uh, Matthew shared as well as what David has talked about on the technology to reduce burdens. And finally, you know, from within, uh, establish a strong um, anti-financial crime culture. So um, this is the question that we have here. So I'll just wait maybe about 30 seconds. Um, as we get the results um, out for you. Okay. Um, Right, so the, the majority of um, I think the, the attendees here has um, responded. So over 43.9% have said, set your risk appetite clearly and um, perform risk assessment. So I think that is by far the, the number one. Uh, and then the second one following closely is using the right technology to reduce burden. So I think, um, you know, we can get the panel to, to just, you know, chime in a few notes uh, from here. But by looking at the fact that if we set a risk-based approach as soon as possible, uh, we set up the right framework and, you know, adopting it and executing it through the right technology uh, seems to be the way that uh, most of our attendees are looking at. Um, any any comments from, uh, you know, Gavin or Henry or Matthew? Yeah, I, I, Cliff, I just think it's really interesting that nearly half of the people on, on the call want to understand setting, setting the risk appetite and, and perform risk assessments. That, that's really encouraging from our perspective because that is absolutely the right way to underpin all the other more tactical uh, initiatives that people must take. But we can set that out um, really uh, set out in the guide talking about a, 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 a risk framework and a, a, a risk matrix to help people um, do this practically where we're, um, we're, we're showing how um, leaders can help plot individual cases. So I'm really happy to talk more about that, but uh, um, it's really encouraging to see that that's the, uh, that's the, the most um, interesting 
point at this stage because I say it absolutely must underpin all, all the other work. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And, and also maybe before we move on to the case studies, um, the second one is actually using the right technology to reduce burdens. Maybe, uh, David, if you could just share a bit more on, you know, why is, I mean, we are living in a technology-driven society today. So maybe you could share why, why is this such an important thing uh, in doing financial crime compliance? Yeah, it's interesting to see that one up there in the, in the, in the top concerns. I think, you know, there is so much technology out there that, you know, I think it can feel quite overwhelming to try and hone in on which is the right technology for your specific business processes. And, you know, that, that, that sort of wealth of, of trying to sort of focus on that is, is about working out what you're, um, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and one of the other points, actually, I think is really relevant about the uh, risk appetite, risk assessment, and also audit is anytime you're introducing technology, particularly automation technology, uh, such as AI, gives you an opportunity to start to make your, your, your uh, compliance or adverse media checking process much more consistent and means that everything can be logged from start to finish automatically rather than the the sort of vagaries of human behavior. So, you know, I, I think there's there's a there's a lot to sort of unpack about the technology and how um, it, it can be tailored for your specific um, business workflows. Thanks, um, David. That's really insightful um, to, to hear that as well. So I think um, what we can, you know, nicely move into is actually to a, a case study. Um, so I'll pass this on to Henry Williams. Uh, so Henry will be going to talk to us about more on a recent case study uh, that, that uh, we'll be all quite familiar with in this region. Um, so over to you, Henry. Thanks very much, Cliff. Um, so, hi guys, sorry, I've moved a slide too far. Let's go back. So I think what I'd like to do is we've been talking quite a lot about the theory of adverse media screening AMS. Uh, but I think it's really important to see this in practice. Um, and so there's some case studies I've sort of looked at, which I think would be, um, offer really good examples, one good uh, and one bad. So let's start the bad one first, which is 1MDB, uh, which you're probably all familiar about in the region. Uh, but just to go over, 1MDB was a scandal where the Malaysian government um, set up a development fund called 1MDB and issued lots of bonds, which was supposedly for development in Malaysia. In fact, they were stolen by um, a very high level uh, group of people um, and as a result, the uh, Malaysian Prime Minister at the time, Najib Razak, is currently on trial for misappropriating a lot of the money stolen from 1MDB. Um, so I think this is a really good showcase of how the international financial system can be used by money launderers. You had sort of sovereign wealth funds in the UAE in implicated. You had luxury good makers being implicated. Um, in fact, the case um, precipitated the fall of the Malaysian government. Um, so I'm going to try and rattle through this quite quickly because I see we've got quite a lot of questions to have within the hour. Uh, but what I'd just like to explain is how adverse media checks could have been used to spot 1MDB fraud earlier. Um, so when we're doing this and we're looking at this sort of six-point plan Gavin showed earlier, you set your risk appetite. Now, there's quite a lot of risks associated with 1MDB. Firstly, Malaysia is a country of a history of corruption and it doesn't have a free press. Um, so you have to look at that and say, OK, well, we're going to have to look quite closely at our sources to understand um, where we're going to get useful information from. Then 1MDB itself, it was a, a state-backed um, body, and the person in charge was, was the Prime Minister, who also doubled as Malaysia's Ministry of fin Minister of Finance. Uh, so there's a, another couple of potential red flags. Um, and finally, I'd say one of the biggest red flags was... Um, as they say in law enforcement, Najib Razak had previous. Um, he was described by opposition figures as institutionally corrupt in 2009. And he was also, it was speculated that um, a sale of um, French submarines to Malaysia, uh, he was implicated in some backhand deals there. And in fact, the middle person involved in that deal was also accused of being his mistress and was later found murdered. So there's a few things there which should automatically say, OK, we ought to be looking at this more closely than just doing a standard adverse media quick check. So what are the early warnings bearing in mind that with a state-backed press, um, it's 
more difficult to get um, sort of negative information about senior figures in Malaysia. Well, what you have here is you have opposition figures who have permanently been sort of nipping at Najib Razak's heels uh, uh, to get him to sort of open up more um, about what was going on in the country. And what they say was reported more widely in the Malaysian press. So, for instance, in 2009-2010, Anwar Ibrahim described um, Najib Razak's um, 1MDB as his Najib's slush fund. At the same time, you had Joe Lau, who um, was running around San Tropez in Las Vegas spraying champagne anywhere. Uh, the New York Post famously commented, no one spends their own money like that. Now, Joe Lau wasn't um, directly linked to the fund and always denied that he was. Uh, but even by 2010, a lot of um, Malaysian newspapers had started putting the pieces together. He was involved in the Tarangana Investment Authority, which came into being as 1MDB later. Um, and he was known to be close to Najib Razak's wife. So there was, there was enough information out there to say we shouldn't be going near this. But what happened was in 2012, so two years after a lot of this information came out, Goldman Sachs started to arrange $6.5 billion worth of bonds for a state-backed entity and took a huge $200 million chunk for itself for this. So these figures don't add up either. So again, this is a huge red flag. Um, and I think what's really interesting, especially for the compliance professionals on this um, webinar, is that Tim Leisner, who's the Goldman executive who essentially orchestrated these bond deals, said that at Goldman's at the time, there was a culture to conceal from compliance. So you had the people making the deals who didn't want their compliance teams looking too closely. Um, so this is where you, adverse media screening is really important because you can't take what the front office is saying is given. You have to do your own checks. Um, and just as a result, I, this isn't being wise after the event. I think through poor adverse media screening, um, amongst a lot of other things, Goldman Sachs is now facing a $2 billion fine. Um, so that's a real example of sort of bad practice. Um, here's a quick example of good practice, uh, which is um, a casino we were working with in, in the UK. Um, so typically in casinos and high net worth ones, um, they will do sanctions checks on their customers. Uh, so in this case, um, a Turkish gentleman came in and um, wanted to gamble. They ran his name across some sanctions screens, as they do, and it, they found he came up. Um, he explained to them that he was linked to a bank which was sanctioned, but it was no longer, um, and that actually he was fine to go ahead and gamble. Um, so this is where the nuance provided by adverse media screening is really useful because they did um, adverse media checks on him. And sure enough, they found that actually he was linked to a $5 billion money laundering ring in Turkish Cyprus. And the bank he was mentioned was implicated in terrorist financing. Um, so through that, they could sort of see the nuance behind the sanctions, realize that they should be in place, and that man um, um, showed a potentially very high terrorist financing risk and money laundering through casinos. Um, and so they refused him entry. Uh, the coda to this story is that actually he just walked down the road and um, walked into another casino, no questions asked. Um, so it's really important to show that um, adverse media screening is a hugely important tool uh, to identify when you are potentially facing problems. And I think as Goldman Sachs itself shows, uh, the risks, um, if you get it wrong, are very high. Uh, so I'll be back to you, Cliff and Gav, to uh, sum up, I think. Cliff, I think you might be on mute. Sorry, apologies. Uh, yeah, uh, a webinar must have some technical issues, uh, like we all, all know too well. Um, okay, so I think I think it's a good summary of what we, we just discussed with 1MDB. Uh, and I think what we could do next is we have quite a number of questions coming in uh, from a very interactive um, uh, audience today. So I think it'd be good for us to uh, just go through and um, you know share these questions with the panel. And I'm happy for any of you guys to, to take this. Uh, so I think the first one that we had uh, that just came in, is how does an organization achieve balance uh, between an anti-financial crime culture and still be competitive in the market? Because many of the organizations that we that have joined us today, they, they often launch new products in the market. However, financial crime controls are not looked at or are very late in the game. Um, so your thoughts um, on, on, on this? So uh, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, you know, Henry or, or Kevin could just share a bit more from a consultancy uh, um, background. Um, how how would you you know advise on, on this on this uh, framework? Uh, well, look, 
Cliff, thanks very much, and and th thank you to the to the person who asked it, asked that question. I think, like clearly, we we've talked about the regulatory framework as it exists, and and, and the guidance from um, in country regulators and and FATF and others. So there there is some framework uh, there, but I, I just want to come back to um, the the is, is new products are developed, firms must use that. Uh, regulation uh, and best practice, but they must do so and, and can use the, this setting the risk appetite and risk tolerance in the way that I described. And, and really what what I referred to earlier was um, firms setting out a risk tolerance map, trying to show risk levels and, uh, and, and risk tolerance uh, and, and then mapping uh, their, their, their limits effectively. And then what we've found works really well is then using real life cases to to overlay onto that that map to give um everyone from the board level downwards a a really clear understanding of the risk that a firm is willing to accept accept you know when when they're um developing um the new products but you know anti financial crime uh work if done properly should be an enabler of good business actually it shouldn't be a barrier it should help firm firm firms should see it as a way to um differentiate themselves and differentiate their products in the markets in which they're operating thanks uh, for that um so so i think we have another question and sorry um for this but, but back to you henry again is a question um uh, for Henry here is, um, you know, in terms of uh, the history of money laundering concerns. So earlier when you did uh, the presentation on uh, the case study uh, for 1MDB, uh, so when we say that Malaysia have the history of money laundering concern, uh, but as we see the overall AML governance has uh, been of relatively high standards, right? So from doing business with this country is relatively on the lower risk side of things. So what are your thoughts, right? Uh, because of this, this incident and how do you view um, this particular um, case. Thanks, Cliff. Um, I mean, I think Malaysia is a really interesting case because um, I agree with you that like, actually its governance standards are um, comparatively, especially by the region, considered quite good. And you have the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission um, and BNM who are both, um, you know, very active regulators. I do think, though, um, sadly in Malaysia, you still have a political uh, class at the top who are driving a lot of um, a lot of instances of corruption, and um, you know, I, there's there's no guarantee that Najib Razak will actually face justice for um, his alleged crimes. And I think actually, if you look, um, so the corporate liability law came into Malaysia on June the first, and a week later, Musa Aman, who's a former governor of Sabah State, walked free of 46 charges of corruption and money laundering. Um, so you also have um, Riza Aziz, um, who's the uh, stepson of Najib Razak has also uh, walked away from the charges he's faced over 1MDB. Um, so I completely agree that Malaysia's got, it's got some great protocols for countering corruption. Uh, but I think there's, um, there's potential political pressure at the top, which means these aren't enforced very well. Uh, and we're seeing, certainly seeing some worrying developments um, over the last couple of months, um, which suggests that actually uh, money, um, money laundering and corruption could return as a big problem in Malaysia. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for for answering that as well. So I think I think we we touched a bit on um, you know the framework. We touched a bit more on the country specific um, case study. So on on the on the technology side, I think there was a couple of questions that we have um, coming in as well. And, and this one is for you, David. Um, so I think one of uh, so there are two questions here. I think one is how do you screen in multiple languages and alphabets? Uh, so that is the first one. And I think the other one that we have um, in, in a similar form is. What is AI, right? I mean, can you share a bit more on what AI really means and, and why isn't human intelligence better than AI? Uh, so maybe you could share us a bit more on this. Yeah, no problem. So I guess on the first one around multiple languages, this this is something that comes up a lot and you know, people always have this implicit, you know, Google-like mentality of 
you know, looking for things using a search engine. Uh, and, that, and that leads you open to only searching for the things you know about, only searching for the things that you uh, can think of at the time, you know, adding keywords, bootstrapping words like cor bribery, corruption, and, and maybe only in your own language. When you use automation and when you can sort of apply a consistent process to all of this um, business process, um, it means you can expand out these terms automatically. Um, so you can take a name, you know, David Bolson, you can render that in dozens and dozens of scripts. So Arabic, Cyrillic, you know, Chinese, simplified, et cetera, and, and all, all other languages. Um, and then you can run those matches against the wealth of data that's out there, both in the adverse media sense, but also in the, you know, traditional sanctions and watch list type data. Um, so, you know, names, you know, are very, very easy. The, the one that's, you know, more, more interesting, I suppose, is the uh, risk topics themselves. And again, that can be done in multiple languages by training uh, what we call classifiers to detect risk within um, particular news data. So uh, that can be done in, again, dozens of languages. And it means that when you search for the, for the, for the concept of corruption, um, that's not just the English version of corruption. It's also the Malay version of corruption. It's also the um, you know, Chinese version on, and also the Thai and other languages in the region. So, you know, language is a really important part of seeing the full picture and not just focusing on, on the words that you know about or the languages you care about. Um, the other question is about broadly about AI and, and reducing false positives. So uh, just very briefly, um, you know, there, there's no one thing you can do to reduce false positives. Um, you know, it, it's always a collection of different technologies you can assemble. Uh, the first thing is to reduce noise. Um, a lot of data that you return from a Google search or what have you is noisy. Um, so things like, uh, you know, news that's not about financial crime, right? You can, you can already eliminate a lot of noise. Uh, just by focusing in on, on the, the relevant data. Uh, the, the second is about matching and about improving the technology for matching. And then the last thing is about risk thresholds and about scoring uh, the quality and relevance of those matches. And I think if you can do all three of those in sequence and do them in real time so that it's not just about a one-off check, it's actually about a continuous process, then I think you have a really good chance of reducing uh, false positives very, very considerably. Hopefully that answers the gentleman's questions. Yes, um, thank you very much, David. I think that's very helpful. I think using the technology um, to embed into our daily lives to help us reduce um, you know, all this work as well. So I think I think we still have um, time for one one more question, uh, and, and not to worry for the rest of the questions that are not answered. We will come back to you in an email as well. So I think this last question is from Matthew. Uh, so I think Matthew, could you just share? Um, in, in your experience over the last 25 years, right? Um, any examples in your line of work they can best that as an investigator you could share with us? Um, yeah, thanks, Cliff. Um, well, quite a few, as you would imagine. Um, but, but touching on, I guess, um, this area of adverse media, media screening, we've got to be aware that um, the people that are out there actually to undertake, you know, fraud, corruption, and, and that's their business. Um, they're out there to commit malfeasance or also aware of this. And they, they partake in, you know, cosmetic, cosmetic media um, and, and put themselves in the media in, in good light, put themselves in relationships in good light. So you've got a lot of politically exposed people that will become, you know, heads of charities and um, be photographed with the right people and be in the press for the right reasons. And... Um, uh, one such case that I'm working on is actually the serious fraud office in uh, the UK uh, is a group, a family group that they were doing business across Asia um, in terms of shipping. Um, and they were basically using letters of credit and trade finance to manipulate 20, 20 or 30 banks. Some of those banks are on the call today. Um, and they were basically left alone to do this for about 18 months on the basis of people's perception of because they were a good family um, in the public light and in the media. They were um, benefactors or they were you know, assisting charities and, and uh, you know, social and cultural um, events and, and organisations throughout their regions of business and, and where they resided. It was almost as if 
you know, they were too, too um, suspect on doing these things. But once you scratch the surface, um, and we did so, we understood the, the, the true intentions of their business was to extract as much money where, as they could from various organisations and then to um, take it into areas of um, low or non-extradition or where we couldn't recall the assets. So it's very important to understand who you're dealing with, and that includes looking past that veneer, the first layer of perception, um, and and going into that into the depths of knowledge and understanding who you're dealing with. Uh, and businesses have to take in that. I mean, if you're looking to gamble on a situation where you know you're looking at cosmetics of a relationship, you can only see your integrity once, and after that, it's a long road back. Um, to actually re-establish integrity, integrity and your reputation. So it's very important to look behind the curtain and understand who you're dealing with. Yeah, so thanks, um, Matthew, for that. That's uh, insightful. So I think beyond just looking at the, on the surface, it's really important for us to look um, for that in that, uh, coming from an investigator background as well. So I think I think in the last you know three four minutes that we have um, before we finish off today's webinar, um, the remaining questions that we have, as I mentioned before, we will send to you uh, by an email uh, to your replies. Uh, but maybe before we wrap this up, uh, we'll just go around the panel to see if there's any more uh, closing remarks um, by the four of our our uh, panelists today. Maybe we'll start with um, you first, David. Yeah, no, I think uh, the advice in the in the in the report that we're going to distribute after this event is really important to digest, um, identifying the right technology, mapping it directly to your um, risk based approach and using uh, the, you know, the advances in, you know, artificial intelligence machine learning um, to really, you know, uh, uh, improve um, risk screening, I think is, is just really important. Thank you, um, David. Um, over to you, Gavin. Yeah, thank, thanks so much, Cliff. You know, I, I just think that some of the challenges that, that those 300 people on this call identified an hour ago are challenges that um, uh, leaders uh -huh. and those on the front line face every day. So you're absolutely not alone. Um, there are ways to try to run adverse media screening more effectively using some of the tools and techniques that David has talked about, the, the way that, that, that here at Themis we've tried to frame the way to structure um, these, these investigations um, and to set the right culture. So de de delighted to be able to, to speak to you all. And, and, and as Cliff says, as a, as a group, we're here to help uh, develop any of those themes more, more broadly. Sure. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and and uh, Henry, to you for your thoughts. Yeah, hi, Cliff. Um, thanks. Um, I think actually I'd really like to echo what Matthew just said about peering behind the curtain. Um, I think when we're doing adverse media screening, you need to have the right protocols in place, but you really need to have an investigative mindset. Um, you can't take anything as read. You have to understand why this information appears as it does. And, and as you have to peer deeper. And I, I appreciate that for a lot of people in this call. They're doing it at significant scale. Um, and so the only way really to round this is you have to be investigative in your own mindset. Um, and certainly the other thing I would just say is just try and re read widely around corruption and financial crime, uh, because fraudsters always use the same tactics. Um, and I think if you can sort of develop your sort of knowledge around a sort of wider topic, you'll be able to pick up things much more quickly and see things which perhaps other people won't. Thank you, um, Henry. And finally, to, to you, Matthew. Yeah. I guess, um, again, uh, echoing um, what we've all said, but, you know, as a community, as a group, as businesses, it's incumbent on us, but it's incumbent on us as individuals um, to exercise professional scepticism, um, not only to protect the organisations, communities, countries and whatever, but also to protect ourselves. So if we don't ask those uncomfortable questions early on, it's going to come back by us and the country and the community. <laughs> but ultimately, protect yourself by asking those uncomfortable questions and going deeper layer, because it is incumbent on all of us to ask those extra questions and just go a bit deeper. So my advice to everyone, be professional, but be sceptical in respect to how you're dealing with it. 
Thank you, Matthew. Um, and I think in view of time, we have just about under a minute um, right on time for this webinar. Just want to thank uh, all the speakers, so David, Kevin, Henry, and Matthew for sharing uh, so much of your experience and insights from technology to framework, to consultancy, to investigations. I think these are all very helpful. Um, and hopefully the audience today uh, who took an hour to join us today can really benefit from this. Um, I think the slides will be sent out to you guys. Um, questions that uh, some of the existing questions that we may not answer uh, because of time will also be re uh, responded uh, shortly in the next few days. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us uh, today. And we look forward to seeing you in the next uh, webinar. So stay safe and, and healthy. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.